All right, welcome everybody to Haitian History 101 Live. Uh, thanks for joining us. Man, this is Friday. It's the last session of the Haitian History 101 webinar. I've had a blast Monday through Thursday. Man, we shared a lot of information and, um, and I had a great time, right? So uh, today is the last session. So um, we have a special uh, treat for you guys today and um, looking forward to it. So uh, right now it's about 12.55, so we're gonna get started. Uh, we're gonna get started in about five minutes. We're gonna start on time. Um, I've noticed a lot of people have had issues logging on. Uh, for some reason, they're in a different meeting room. So if you have the, if you have the, I'm sorry, if you have the um, uh, link that you use today and you know someone that's having an issue logging on, just share that link with them so that they can make it into the correct meeting room uh, so that they can get the information as well. But uh, all this stuff is going to be recorded. Today is going to be recorded. The only session that was not recorded was part one uh, when we talked about the, uh, the Arawak kingdom and the Spanish invasion, uh, which was a great program. I'm sorry that we um, weren't able to record it. Maybe we'll do that one again and record it. But um, yeah, but it's been great sharing all this information with you guys. So again, we're gonna get started uh, in about four minutes or so at 1 p.m. And uh, we're gonna get on with today's program. Yeah, I'm gonna, the Arawak, that story was so, was so good, the Arawak. I mean, we went over not just their encounter with the, with the Spanish invaders, but Taino life in general, right? Before, uh, they were in IET for thousands of years, right? So um, we went into their life, um, you know, the imprint that they, still have in Haiti um, on the whole island, as a matter of fact. So, uh, you know, they were the ones that inhabited the land the longest. So I don't like when we, when people talk about the history of Haiti and they leave out the indigenous population. So I wanted to make an effort to share their history um, on this program. In fact, I always start with the Taino history before I get into Haitian history, even in my book, in my first book, I talk about the time, you know, so. Yes, indeed. So it's 12.58, um, about two minutes, you're going to get started. Uh, I don't want to start too early because I started, I was advertising 1 p.m. Let's see. And then um, what else did we talk about? Yesterday's program was good too. We talked about um, the US occupation of Haiti uh, from 1915 to 1934. And I actually did a presentation a couple of years ago that I replayed yesterday. Um, and then we had a nice discussion about it um, afterwards. So that was really good. I had a lot of a lot of fun, received a lot of great feedback from that session. I've been receiving great feedback on all the sessions. So I'm happy that uh, people are appreciating, you know, what Dave and I are doing, uh, you know, taking time out to help share some of our history because a lot of this stuff is not known, right? Yeah, it's not, especially if you live in this country or you, are, you went through your education in this country, they don't talk about Haiti too much. And most of the stuff, that you have to learn 
you know, you have to go out and do your own research. And of course, if that's not your area of expertise, then, you know, you can't spend all day and all night learning about the history of Haiti. So uh, I'm happy that, you know, I'm able to share some information, um, you know, on our beloved IET. All right, well, you just know about the conference. That's all good because um, I hope I'll be able to find it later. Yeah, well, all the conferences, all the sessions have been recorded. Well, not all of them, all except for one. So, uh, Listen, guys, be quiet. I'm trying to hear. <laughs> okay, no problem. I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, oh, mute everybody so that you don't have to have an issue with your background noise. But, um, or, you know, if you come on, you know, definitely mute yourself if you find that you know, you're unmuted for some reason. Uh, but I'm going to try to mute everyone as they, as they get, as they come on to the chat. All right. So, yeah, so like I said, all the most, well, all except one session was recorded. So at the end of this session, uh, I'm going to download it, upload it to YouTube, and I'm going to send out the link to all of the recordings that we did this week so that you guys could catch up. And I'm also in talks. Hello, of everyone. Hey, how you doing? All right, thanks for making your presence known. <laughs> All right. All right, so let's go ahead and, um, and get started. It's one o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Franz de Renicourt Jr. Um, First generation Haitian American, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Both my parents are born and raised in Haiti, right in IET. So, uh, you know, I've been living in the in the states all my life, pretty much, and went through my whole childhood, teenage years, young adult years, not really knowing much about uh, Haitian history, right? Because I went through the education system here. They don't talk about Haiti at all. The only time they really mention black people uh, in the school that I went to at least um, was with like slavery, right? And civil rights era and stuff like that. So um, some years ago, I got really interested in Haitian history and then I got like started reading up a lot of information. And I realized once I started sharing information with other people, a lot of other people didn't know about too much about Haitian history. So it kind of led me down a path where I started writing uh, children's books or you know stories about different events that happened in Haitian history with the Haitian Revolution, some of our heroes and some of our events. And um, you know, the books have been doing pretty well. And, uh, and now, you know, with the situation that we find ourselves in, where a lot of us are on lockdown, um, who knows how long this lockdown is going to be. I said, well, you know what? I, I, I love sharing this type of information. So let me start a webinar program. And this is good for all kids, kids and adults, people of all ages, all backgrounds that are interested in history, that are interested in great stories. So um, uh, I called on uh, my, my good friend who I'm gonna introduce to you guys to in a few and uh, we put this thing together for everybody. So, so pretty much we started this thing on Monday, right? And like I said, like I mentioned before, we talked about the Arawaks and the Spanish invasion on Tuesday. We talked about slavery, uh, the revolution and independence. On Wednesday, we talked about Dessalines empire, Christoph's kingdom and um, the Republic of Haiti, <clears throat> which came after that. And yesterday we talked about the U.S. invasion of Haiti, uh, which was a cool program. And today, the title of this program is Dictatorship and Democracy, right? So we, we all know that um, Haiti has gone through, you know, a lot of turbulence um, in its history, political history, um, with uh, especially after, I mean, pretty much all throughout for the most part, but after the U.S. invasion of Haiti, uh, they kind of made the, the United States um, 
even though they left Haiti in 1934, they still had a big presence in Haiti and they controlled a lot of the political scene down there ever since they left, right? In fact, a lot of the different presidents that came to power after the um, U.S. left, they all pretty much had U.S. support, right? So most of the presidents, uh, well, I mean, I could probably even say all of the presidents, um, you know, the United States had a say in, you know, in Haiti. So, uh, except for maybe one, but, you know, we'll get into that. And uh, so the U.S. invasion set the stage for uh, the dictatorship that followed. And, um, and, you know, they also played a role in the, the, I should have democracy in quotes right here. But um, what we're going to get into today is we have a very special treat. So my good, a good friend of mine, Dave, uh, that I met up here in DC a few years back, we became very good friends. Uh, he's been helping me co-host the whole week of webinars. And um, he should be on right now. He could give you a little background about himself. Dave, you there? Yes, sir. I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear, brother. All right, perfect. Uh, so, everyone, um, it's been a pleasure to be with you all throughout the week um, to, uh, to do this with France. Uh, as I've mentioned before, um, France and I met while I was uh, in D.C. working at the Haitian Embassy as Director of Culture and Education. And naturally, given uh, France's interest in Haitian history and educating folks about the country's um, history, um, we uh, collaborated and became friends. Um, I've since moved back to Haiti, uh, focusing on running a nonprofit organization called uh, Basketball to Uplift the Youth, uh, which uses uh, the sport basketball as a tool to mentor and educate youth. So, um, live uh, from Haiti uh, to, uh, to uh, share my passion and love for Haitian history with you all. Absolutely, absolutely. And actually, today, since this is going to be the last session of this, um, some years ago, I believe maybe 2011, like almost 10 years ago, geez, um, Dave actually put together um, a documentary, which kind of really falls in line with the subject that we're going to talk about today. Right. Um, I watched it and I was I was like, wow, this is actually really, really good. Um, it captured a lot of documentaries that we see in, about Haiti. I usually I've seen a lot of documentaries about Haiti that's not done by Haitians. Right. It's usually like somebody that travels to the country and they, you know, with a camera crew. And then it's sort of like an outside a outsider's look of Haiti. Right. But um, Dave put together this documentary that I watched and I thought it was really good because of the perspective was from a Haitian perspective. Right. So and the topic, the subject falls in line with the session for today. So, uh, Dave, do you want to talk about a little bit about this um, documentary that you put together? Uh, and then I'm going to go ahead. Yeah, and uh, up. So this is a, a project that I did during my um, last year of college um you know i studied political science at yale and um you know i really wanted to focus on the democratization of haiti um after the fall of the the volume of dictatorship in 1986 um that's what i wrote my and my thesis on and so i wanted to also do a documentary given my interest in filmmaking I wanted to do a documentary that also accompanies um this uh, thesis that i wrote and so that's how I, uh, you know, went down to Haiti to film um, parts of it. Actually, led a, a Yale International Relations Association delegation to Haiti to observe um, the uh, elections that were held in uh, November 2010, and use other footage to uh, to put together this documentary. The documentary it starts out in 1492, um, and it uh, you know pretty much does a recap of Haitian history, a lot of that we've covered throughout this week. It summarizes it in about 10 minutes, and then the rest of the documentary uh, focuses on the uh, pivotal 2010 elections that were held in Haiti after uh, the earthquake happened um, in January 2010. So um, I think it's a good summary of everything that we've uh, discussed and covered throughout the week, and also uh, provides you with an in-depth analysis of the 
democratic process in Haiti and one particular election, um, the 2010-2011 elections. Absolutely, absolutely. And you also did a really good job covering, um, summarizing the, the dictatorship, the Duvalier yeah, dictatorship, with I, which I enjoyed a lot. And, um, and then after we viewed the, dic the, um, the documentary, then I'm going to open it up, right? I'm gonna open it up to questions. You guys can actually unmute yourselves and ask questions. Uh, you could put your questions in the chat room area um, while the documentary is going on. So that you could just kind of have like an overall discussion. And it doesn't just have to be on today's topic. It could be on anything, right? I'm not an expert. <laughs> I don't claim to be an expert on Haitian history or Haitian politics and all that stuff. You know, I'm just, you know, a proud Haitian, just like a lot of you that's on here right now, um, who loves the topic of history. But I don't, I don't ever claim to be an expert and a know-it-all, right? So, um, so after you watch this documentary, I still want to open it up um, to everyone, right? And you could share stories or you could share, you could ask questions or you could just share in this thing. Since it's the last day, we're just gonna sort of have like a, a open format where everybody can express themselves. And um, that's what we're gonna do. So let me go ahead and get the documentary started. You guys are gonna love this documentary. So definitely, um, you know, be, let's be tuned into this thing and then we're gonna have a great discussion afterwards. All right? All right, here we go. I'm not sure if you could put the volume up on your end. It's sounding a bit low. Uh, that's the highest I could get it. Okay. Let me know when the narration talks, if it's still too low. Thank you. Welcome to the Pearl of the Caribbean. No, this is I not the Bahamas, Jamaica, or any other island typically associated with beautiful beaches. This is Haiti, home to some of the most beautiful beaches in the world. In addition to its breathtaking coastline, Haiti also prides itself on great cuisine, talented artists, and vibrant culture. Unfortunately, Haiti is also home to the poorest people in the Western Hemisphere, and these are the images that the country is typically identified with. But Haiti wasn't always the poorest country in this hemisphere. The opposite, actually. The island of Haiti was discovered by Christopher Columbus in 1492, and he named it Hispaniola, or Little Spain. In 1697, under the Treaty of Ryswick, the island was divided into two, with the Spanish retaining the eastern part of the island, now the Dominican Republic, and the French receiving the western part. The French would call their side of the island Saint-Domingue, and it would become the economic jewel of the French Empire and more prosperous than all 13 of the British colonies of North America combined. This was achieved through the establishment of large sugar and coffee plantations that allowed the French to amass a great amount of wealth. The labor supply for these plantations consisted of hundreds of thousands of West Africans brought to the island against their will over the course of a century, many of whom died due to the brutal working conditions. These inhumane working conditions, coupled with news of the revolution in France, would lead the slaves to revolt in 1791. Through the leadership of men such as Toussaint Louverture and Jean-Jacques Dessaly, the slaves battled with the French over the course of the next 12 years. It was here in Arcaïe that the first Haitian flag was sewn and Dessalines was named the leader of the Revolutionary Army. Six months later, they defeated Napoleon's French army. Slaves declared their independence on January 1st, 1804, and in the process, Haiti became the first and only country in history to be created from a successful slave rebellion and the world's first black republic. These turn of events also affected Haiti's neighbor and the only other independent country in the Americas at the time, the United States. At the time, President Jefferson wanted to buy the French port of New Orleans. But since France had just lost its much more profitable colony, Haiti, Napoleon decided to offer Jefferson the entire Louisiana territory instead. The Louisiana Purchase ended up doubling the size of the United States. In 1825, French Emperor Charles X 
would demand reparations from Haiti for France's loss of economic and human property during the War of Independence. Faced with the threat of invasion and having no allies, Haitian President Jean-Pierre Royer was forced to agree to pay the crushing debt of 150 million francs, or $21 billion in today's money, a sum that Haiti would not finish paying until 1947. To make matters worse, the United States refused to recognize Haiti's independence since it was a country of free slaves and slavery was still an integral part of American society. Due to these factors, the fledgling nation never got on its feet, and by the early 20th century, Haiti had become politically and economically unstable. Thus, in 1915, the US Marines invaded Haiti to restore stability and protect its interests, in the words of Woodrow Wilson. The country would be under American occupation until 1934. Following the departure of the Americans, a negritude movement, priding itself in Haiti's gloried past, emerged, and it culminated with the rise to power of François Papadoc Duvalier in 1957. Papadoc would declare himself president for life in 1964, and his regime became known for its human rights abuses and the killing of thousands of Haitians. His private army, known as the Dondon Makut, inspired fear in every Haitian. His repressive rule led to a significant decrease in tourism, the country's biggest source of income, and it also caused many educated Haitians to flee the country. Meanwhile, the US supported the Duvalier regime since Fidel Castro had recently risen to power in Cuba, and Duvalier labeled himself as anti-communist. Following his death in 1971, Papa Doc was succeeded by his son, Jean-Claude Baby Doc Duvalier, who was only 19 at the time. Baby Doc would continue his father's repressive rule, but would stray from his father's path by forming an alliance with the mulatto elite through his marriage to Michelle Bennett. Their fairy tale wedding was recorded in the Guinness Book of World Records as third most expensive at the time. The fireworks alone cost $100,000. Michelle became notorious for her extravagant lifestyle and was known to routinely exceed her $100,000 monthly allowance. She would have lavish parties that were broadcasted on national television for the starving population to see. In December of 1985, she went on a Parisian shopping spree and spent well over a million dollars. With the government unable to meet the country's needs due to its misallocation of resources, the Haitian people had had enough and there was widespread unrest. In 1986, Baby Doc was forced out of Haiti and left the country on an American plane to France. Following Duvalier's departure, the general of the Haitian army, Henri Nafi, would lead a council that would govern until a new president was elected. There was much unrest in Haiti during that time and the elections would not be held until 1990. The top two candidates were Marc Bazin, who was a World Bank official and labeled as America's candidate, and Jean-Bertrand Aristide, a popular priest known for his sermons decrying the living conditions of the Haitian masses. Aristide was elected president through mass support from Haiti's impoverished majority. Aristide would call his popular movement La Valasse, or the Cleansing Flood. But the economic elites were not in favor of the populist priest, and seven months into his presidency, he would be forced out of office through a military coup. Immediately after, violence erupted in Haiti, and thousands of Aristide's followers would be massacred, and military general Raoul Cedras would become the de facto leader of the country. In 1994, the United States would send 20,000 U.S. troops to Haiti, and President Bill Clinton would have Aristide reinstated to finish his term. But in return, Aristide had to commit to a set of economic policies of privatization, deregulation, and low tariffs on foreign imports, which he had previously opposed. But Aristide did manage to dismantle the Haitian army. With only one year left in Aristide's term, new elections were to be held. Aristide's close friend and Prime Minister René Préval would be elected president. Five years later, in 2000, Aristide would be elected for a second term and he would once again find himself at odds with the economic elites of the country. To counter the elites and his other opponents, Aristide began to use some of the same tactics that the dictators of the past were so fond of. 
He funded groups of thugs from Haiti's most infamous slum, Cité Soleil. And these thugs, known as Chimer, were responsible for widespread violence that plagued the country. In February 2004, rebels took control of northern Haiti and eventually laid siege to the capital. Under disputed circumstances, Aristide was flown out of Haiti aboard an American plane, claiming afterwards that he had been kidnapped and was forced to leave the country. In the aftermath of Aristide's departure, the United Nations sent a stabilizing force known as Minister to Haiti, and an interim government was established. Elections were planned for 2006. René Préval would once again be elected president. Over the next couple of years, the minister and the Haitian police were able to capture many of the thugs behind the murders and kidnappings that were plaguing the country, and security improved considerably. As you know, Haiti is at a turning point. It has a real chance for stability and potential uh, prosperity. Uh, president Clinton and I wanted to support the efforts of President Préval and Prime Minister Pierre-Louis. I think that Haiti has the best chance to escape the darker aspects of its history uh, in the 35 years I have been going there. Oh, yeah. 
Following the aftermath of the earthquake, the death toll was estimated to be 230,000. A total of 3 million people were affected by the earthquake with 300,000 injured and 1.5 million homeless. Nearly 5,000 schools, 250,000 residences and 30,000 commercial buildings had been damaged or destroyed. It was the worst disaster per capita in recorded history. On January 12th, which happened to be a normal day, turned out to be the worst day of our lives. Mediation, January 12th, changed our lives. We, we, are, we are surviving right now because the situation is getting worse maybe. And I think that uh, I'm grateful to be alive. Two or three days later, Family members were still getting text messages from people under the wall mm -hmm. saying that I'm alive, I'm in this side, you know, uh, try to see if you can get me. And, and, and in like two days, it was like, wow, I was like, wow, feeling and seeing what everybody all over the world trying to help, trying to come here uh, to save people under the walls, uh, to, 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 to bring water, food. Uh, shelters to, to people, and that was really, really quick. Unfortunately, uh, 10 months after the earthquake, you can still feel that there's nothing really going on in the term of consumption. We see how people homeless, people dying every day for different diseases. It's a fact that you're in a really bad situation due to your lack of response from the international community right now? I think that the first thing uh, is uh, it's a lack of leadership locally. You know, uh, as as everybody knows it, like our actual president, William Bilal, it took like eight days to address the nation, and that was like for me a lack of leadership because uh, at this time you can see that we really need someone locally, a good leader, to tell the international community, to tell everybody. This is what you have to do, and this is where you have to do it. And as you can see, this lack of leadership uh, 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 create uh, a kind of chaos, I can say, uh, in terms of different NGOs working, different different NGOs trying to to get money to help baby. And at the end of the day, nothing is done. And if we had a leadership to tell this international community, to tell those NGOs, okay, fine. You're here to help. This is my problem. This is my issues. This is what I expect you to do. And maybe two NGOs could get together to do to, to do or to, to resolve one of the issues. At the end of 2009, before the earthquake even struck Haiti, there were already an astounding 10,000 NGOs active in the country. And Haiti had the highest number of NGOs per capita on the planet. Now, there's a bigger problem with respect to the government and the, the fact that there are so many NGOs how can NGOs work harmoniously with the government? Uh, by diverting all the resources to the NGOs, it's going to uh, emasculate the government as far as being able to, to do big projects, but then the government's been so corrupt and so ineffective. But, you know, there's the offsetting argument is that if you didn't have the NGOs, nothing would be done. The children that we get are near death's door. If they aren't handy, handicapped, they are so malnourished. One of our babies that is in line to be a jack who came to us and he was four months old and he was about the size of just maybe a one month old. And they said he was within 24 to 48 hours of dying. Well now he's a little bit little bruiser and he's just cruising around. He just turned one and um, he's got four or five teeth and he's learning to walk and so those are the wonderful stories now as far as haitians helping haitians you know like building up ngos with haitians i've seen so many of them and um a lot of them mostly because we are like twitter addicts so mostly most of them i see them on twitter like one of them i, I became friend with him like a couple of weeks ago we knew all for Haiti. His dad actually has a hospital in Beogan that they're trying to rebuild because they lost everything on January 12th too. So, you know, those small NGOs, they're, they're trying to build up now, right now. And it's like, I 
see that January 12th was the wake up time for most of this generation. Because this guy that I'm telling you who has video for Haiti, he's only 25, 26. I, I'm the coordinator for the Sunday Project. It's a movement, it's a grassroots movement we started on Easter Sunday with the children of Cité Soleil. KNBDF, c'est réseau national pour promotion de la femme. Le travail de terrain a fait, si on travaille volontaire, pour que nous même dans le quartier défavorisé, pour que nous avons pile de prison qui a fonctionné dans le quartier, nous même comme travail civique, nous avons fait, c'est aider mes dames, pas pour qu'elles déjà dans la zone. Aider mes dames, nous avons frappé le barré, nous avons fait un peu de temps, nous avons fait un peu de temps, nous avons fait un peu de temps, nous avons fait un peu de temps. C'est ça que nous avons fait pour la société. Nous avons fait une chance pour nous. Nous avons fait un cadre de dames haïtiennes. Pour moi-même, je dis à qui me dit que nous volontaires. Je dis que nous avons fait une équipe pour nous travailler. Nous avons fait une chance pour nous. Nous avons fait une chance pour nous. Et là, nous avons fait une chance pour nous. Nous avons fait une chance pour nous. Tout le monde a fait une chance pour nous. Nous avons fait une chance pour nous. Even though many Haitians are doing their part to help with the reconstruction effort, a great number of Haitians who have the education and skill set to help rebuild Haiti reside outside the country. Since the rise of Papa Doc to power in 1957, Haiti has been plagued by a serious brain drain problem, whereby the most educated and talented Haitians tend to leave the country. It is estimated that about 4 million Haitians are now living outside of Haiti. In the country like this, we have the added uh, disadvantage, tragedy in the whole country, that a lot of the resources have been trained. This happened just now. We, in the rural area, we have trained hundreds, maybe thousands of judges, magistrates, uh, lawyers, and many of them, unfortunately, so you need to train the next generation, and you need to train them again, and you need to train the... Bon, là, il y a une chute de cerveau, effectivement, parce que, bon, il y a beaucoup plus d'opportunités à l'étranger pour les gens qui sont éduqués. Par exemple, le Canada avait un programme, euh, donc il y a pas mal, de, pas mal de cadres qui ont laissé le pays pour aller au Canada. Bon, cela ne veut pas dire que vraiment, leur situation a changé, ça a amélioré à au Canada. Mais ça, quand même, a occasionné une chute de cerveau. Parce qu'on peut avoir un diplôme en Haïti, oui, et puis on ne trouve pas un boulot. Bon, à quoi on étudie quand on n'a pas de débouché Donc vous pouvez comprendre qu'effectivement, ça représente vraiment un problème majeur, parce que les gens sont plus qualifiés, vraiment, ont tendance à laisser le pays. Le problème pour les pauvres gens, ils sont juste aussi smart que nous sommes, et ils travaillent plus fort, juste pour garder le corps et le soul ensemble. Mais ils n'ont pas de systèmes et d'organiser des structures that give predictable consequences when they exert good efforts. So for Haiti, for example, the work I'm doing now with the UN, we have to build them systems so that the gifts of their people can be manifest at home and they don't have to come to the United States or Canada or France or someone else just for people to say, boy, those people are smart and gifted and wonderful. Less than 2% of the African-American population is Haitian. 11% of our African-American physicians are Haitians. The head of one of the largest foundations in America is a Haitian-American. Some of the most important people in the healthcare community in New York City are Haitians. The Haitians are rather like the Palestinians. They're only poor in their own backyard, and they deserve a better deal and a chance to build a better future for their children. And I think you can give it to them. With presidential elections scheduled to be held on November 28, 2010, Haitian-born international hip-hop star Wyclef Jean believed that he was the best candidate to build this better future for Haiti's children.
Mike Lefjean was not the only musician to declare his candidacy. One of Haiti's most popular and controversial singers, Michel Martini, also known as Sweet Mickey, declared his candidacy as well. All in all, 34 aspiring presidential candidates declared their candidacy and filed their paperwork with the Electoral Council by the August 7th deadline. On August 20th, the Electoral Council published the list of candidates whose bids had been approved. Wyclef Jean was among the 15 candidates whose bids were rejected. And in his case, it was due to the fact that he had not lived in Haiti for five consecutive years. Martini, on the other hand, was one of the 19 candidates whose bids were approved. There's actually 19 candidates. There's about six or seven serious formidable candidates. First one is this guy named Jusef Stein, who is the future son in law to the current president. Jusef Stein comes from the private sector. Uh, reason is that uh, he is formidable. Because he's backed up by the president. The president has a political machine. And not only does he have a political machine, he has a lot of financial resources. Then you have this guy named Jacques Edouard Alexis, who used to be prime minister twice. Then you have this woman named Monica, who her husband used to be president. And then you have this guy named Leslie Ortez, who is the counterpart to Bill Clinton. Uh, uh, Bill Clinton is the attachment to David. So he's the counterpart to Bill Clinton. Then you have this guy named Henry Segan, who is also part of the Aristide regime. And you have also um, this guy named Charlie Baker. Changement. Nous ne voulons pas que nous continuions à changer. Changement, 
c'est voter Kaina. Voter numéro 68 là. Parce que nous connaissons, nous sommes sûrs, nous certains que nous sommes tous d'accord. Our government would be a government of service. A government that installs in Haiti a government of the people for the people. We haven't had that. We usually have a government that really takes from us and gives nothing back. So this is one of the things that the political party has in its agenda, where all the ministries are doing their jobs. The biggest problem really is the fact that Haitians don't have jobs. My past has been one of creating jobs throughout the country in both agriculture and industry. We create between my partners and I, 10,000 jobs in the country, which support another 70,000 people. My reputation is that of an honest businessman and of someone that, when he gives his word, he keeps his word. Qui a des attitudes, qui des négatives, c'est vrai, même pas pour une nièce rythme qui m'a pas assumé parce que tout le monde, tout le monde qui a des bails fait pas de ça. Raison qui fait qui mène à la vodia, c'est parce que là nous fait bilan pays, nous garder que toute bagaille négative. Il y a ma parole en monde, dit nous avons aucun côté, monsieur, si nous parlons côté, nous parlons à la bim, nous parlons vers le désastre. Moi, je voulais proposer moi, comme citoyen qui vous changer toute attitude. Ça. In an effort to give the Haitian people the opportunity to make an educated vote, debates were held amongst the candidates and televised nationwide for the first time in the country's history. And the debates were moderated by television and radio personality Smoy Noisy. Bon, et en bonne Super expérience, je pense, pour euh, toute la communauté. Et d'abord pour la presse, qui, euh, je crois, a réussi à faire une super expérience, et particulièrement euh, pour avoir réussi à mettre euh, euh, des entités de vision différente ensemble. Donc, je pense que, quand même, euh, avoir une élection avec euh, 19 candidats euh, et avoir euh, un programme. Pour présenter 19 candidats, c'est un peu euh, embarrassant et vous allez comprendre. Donc ce n'est pas la presse qui l'a décidé, c'est la réalité du terrain. Et c'est dommage que l'on ne soit pas dans une société qui comprend que de toute façon on ne peut avoir que trois positions. On est d'accord, on n'est pas d'accord, on est neutre. En principe, dans toute société qui réfléchit véritablement, on devrait avoir au maximum trois points. L'année d'avant, on avait 35. Donc je pense quand même qu'il y a beaucoup d'améliorations euh, dans notre manière de fonctionner, dans notre manière de voir les choses. Parce que si on est sorti de 35 pour euh, arriver à 19, c'est déjà quand même euh, une bonne route de fait. Et je pense que dans les années à venir, on, on aura au moins 4, au grand maximum 5. We are amazed at how many patients we've had with you. Oh, really? Really. Really. And what are their means? There's no good choice. It's dangerous. It doesn't make any difference. And the latest one is, I voted the last time and look at the mess they've got in and I don't want to be responsible for voting somebody else that's not going to be good. The best thing is, what are the problems? Those who will vote for all these people who are in the middle of the Okay? Ils sont plus déterminés. Tandis que les jeunes de la classe moyenne, eux, ils, ils préféraient s'en expectatif parce qu'ils ne vont pas et ils ne vont pas rester faire la queue pendant deux heures de temps sous un soleil. Tandis que les gens de quartier populaire, eux, ils vont rester 5 heures, 6 heures, 8 heures parce qu'ils ont beaucoup plus de, de détermination que les jeunes de la classe moyenne, que les gens comme moi. Donc voilà pourquoi la plupart du temps, eh bien, le vote populaire prime toujours sur le vote des jeunes de la classe moyenne. Yeah, that's a turnout of issues. Very, very minor. They're so cynical. We expect the CEP to carry out its duties in fulfillment of Haitian law and with the transparency 
that befits democracy and that the Haitian people deserve. Welcome to Port au Prince's Parc Jean Marie Versailles, home to an estimated 54,000 people. de 
Omar Mangoué, mais oui, ma frère, donc, et ma félicité au lycée, car ton travail est connaissable. Midway through Election Day, it was announced that 12 of the now 18 candidates for the presidency had convened at a hotel in Botol Prince, demanding the annulment of the elections. Amongst the 12 were the two favorites, Mirlan Maniga and Michelle Martini. But the CEP stood firm and said the electoral process would go on. On December 7th, the CEP released the preliminary results. Maniga was in the lead with 31.37% of the votes, and Celestin was in second place with 22.48% of the votes. Immediately following the release of the preliminary results, hundreds of Martelly supporters flooded the streets of Bottle Prince to protest these preliminary results. <laughs> In an effort to appease the international community, Haitian President René Préval agreed to have a mission of election experts from the Organization of American States, OAS, to do a recount of the votes. On January 13th, the OAS officially submitted its report on the first round of the elections to René Préval. According to the report, Michel Martelly was now in second place with 22.2% of the votes, and Jude Celestin had gone from second to third place with 21.9% of the votes. Mirlan Maniga remained in first place with 31.6% of the votes. Thus, the OAS contingent recommended the removal of the government candidate Jude Celestin from contention in the second round and the inclusion of Michel Martelly instead. On January 31st, US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton visited Haiti. Upon her arrival, she had a meeting with the President René Préval at the National Palace. Following that meeting, Secretary Clinton 
took the time to meet individually with each of the top three candidates who were still awaiting the CEP's final verdict. A few days after, the CEP released the official and final results from the first round. So the STEM was out and Mightily was in. The second round elections were scheduled for March 20th. Maintenant, il me faut transformer mes promesses de campagne en plan d'action. Clairement, j'ai d'énormes défis qui se dressent devant moi et j'entends les relever. Clearly, I have huge challenges in front of me, but I intend to meet them. Haiti is on its way towards what I call a radical change. And 
I think a lot of Haiti's future is going to determine on what the diaspora, the Haitians that are living up here, the four million Haitians that are outside of Haiti, can they indeed and go back and help the future of the country? A lot of Haitian Americans are born outside of Haiti, and we still have Haiti with us. I always want to go back and see, you know, pretty much for myself, where, where I can. You know, the Lord has blessed us. Um, you know, there are a lot of other issues here in the state, so we try to figure out ways that we can help out. <laughs> Go back and let's put the school up. Like, let's raise the funds. What we decided to do was to use the land that we had and build on uh, this area of Christian uh, to build the school for our education. <laughs> y'all all right that was the um presentation or the documentary that dave did an uh, amazing job with so yeah, we actually we actually have a little song that white club sang for us as part of the promotion oh yeah it. i did see that i, I, I forgot that <laughs> yeah white club did a nice little uh IET leve piece yeah. um at the end but um a couple seconds right here Was that, did you personally interview him or you had a host? I did. It was you? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, a lot of the footage is original footage um, that uh, did while, while in Haiti. Right. The political reconstruction of Haiti. And this has been White Clef Sean from the Fuji's. See you there. Yeah, that was a promo that he did for us for the first screening of it back in 2011. Very cool. Very cool. All right, man. Hey, man, I love that documentary, man. I think that was very well done. Um, you were young, man. I saw, I saw that one flick of you. You were, you were young. Man. I was, man. I'm 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it was a lot of work. It was my first. Well, I had done some smaller scale video project. It was a hobby at the time, but this was really hardcore. I mean, I remember pulling a, a lot of all nighters. Uh, me and my partner, we stayed up all night the night before the first screening to finish this. We literally slept on the library floor as the uh, the movie was rendering uh, 
you know, for people who have done uh, filmmaking, uh, you know, that you have to uh, do a lot of rendering hours before you finalize the film. So it was a lot of hard work, but I'm glad that people appreciate it back then and uh, um, all these years later. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I like the, you, you went over a lot of different things. You know I mean? I like the fact that it was focused mostly on that, that election, but you touched a little bit on everything up to yeah. that point. Yeah, and, I want um, to do a project of someone's like never, you know, heard of Haiti or doesn't know anything about the country. Right. That could uh, learn uh, at least a bit about the country before diving into the whole election thing. Um, so they could have a comprehensive uh, understanding of the country's uh, history. Absolutely, absolutely. What was like um, the some of like the more challenging things? I know you focus more a lot on the election, mm -hmm. and uh, that election in particular. I know there was um, a lot of uh, well, it came out a little bit later that there was a lot more U.S. involvement than we actually saw in there. And I try to insinuate a lot of that with the pictures. I saw some of the comments, you know, uh, with, you know, the Clintons and everything, um, that there's a lot of, um, you know, questionable um, things that were, was happening there with the changing of the results of the elections and who ended up being uh, the president at the end. Right, right. And I see that you also put in there, there was like um, some, looked like there was some voter suppression. Right, like there and are definitely. Some and that, you, asked, you asked me about some of the cha more challenging aspects. That was definitely one of the more challenging aspects, especially yeah. since like I mentioned I came down with a couple of with a group of Yale students, um, most of them, um, you know, foreigners. So to be in the middle of that with them, you know, there were uh, images of uh, footage of voters being uh, put on the ground by police officers and going into Cité Soleil with them. So I was definitely, you know. Um, a bit uh, worried, want to make sure that everyone made it out all right. So that was right. definitely one of the more uh, challenging aspects of, of doing this problem. Well, when, you, when you were getting footage of the, um, that in City Soleil, like, did you find the people that were, that were living there, were they like welcoming of you? Like, did they want to get their stories out or were they like kind yeah, of like yeah. blank? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I did some interviews with some voters as they were, um, you know, um, getting ready to vote and asking them and people definitely, especially the people who weren't allowed to vote, um, they wanted it to, to, to be heard. I mean, one guy even said, if it's at the risk of me getting shot, whatever, I, but I just want people to know that they're not allowing me to vote. Right, right. Yeah, man, that was that was, that was really good, man. I I appreciate you sharing that with us, uh, and I appreciate you doing it as well. So, yeah. all right, very good. So here's what I'm gonna do. Um, whoever is out there on the on the webinar right now, if you have a question or if there's something you want us to cover, you can actually unmute yourselves and and ask your question um, instead of texting it on the thing. And then also, I'm gonna go throughout the the text history the chat history and I'll pick out some questions as well. So, all right, let's see what we got here. Uh, please can we review the Arawak kingdom? Uh, I might do the Arawaks again at another date and record it since we, since we missed it, but I'll probably just do like a real, very quick one, um, a quick version of it so that I could have something about it recorded. So uh, I'll put that onto the YouTube with the other videos that I did uh let's see let's see shout out to brooklyn okay oh victoire shout out to brooklyn i see apologies but i'm not able to hear anything uh hopefully people were able to hear it <laughs> uh let's see thanks for doing this okay let's see Dave, where can i find this documentary uh the documentary uh, I know Dave has it on his uh, YouTube. Yeah, I, I haven't. I haven't put it on on um, on YouTube. Um, but I, but, you know, when I first did this, a lot of work went into it. But I just didn't want it to be just publicly available like that. I wanted to just have people view it in screenings. Mm -hmm. But now that you know, ten years later, I'm um, planning on um, you know putting it on on YouTube. So uh, when I do that, I'll definitely let everyone know so that they could um, have it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, cool. All right, let's see. Uh, Clinton makes me sick. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, you know, the Clintons, it's well documented, you know, their involvement and, and all the things um, that they were able to benefit from. 
uh, in Haiti with the, you know, the Clinton Foundation. Was uh, um, during that election time, was the Clinton Foundation already like set in Haiti? Um, yeah, they were already in Haiti and Bill Clinton as well was the UN Special Envoy to Haiti and he chaired the, uh, the commission that was established by the UN to manage all of the funding that uh, member of countries of the UN uh, contributed to Haiti. Mm -hmm. So all of those funds went through the Clinton Foundation and they were able no, not, to... Not to the uh, Clinton Foundation per se, but through the commission that was uh, chaired by um, Bill Clinton. Oh, I see. Okay. So two different entities there. Yeah. So when they say that, you know, um, the Clintons, you know, they like controlled a lot of the different funds, especially around that earthquake time, Mm -hmm. And I remember there was a story that was out that they received like, like hundreds of millions of dollars and they only built four houses or something like that. That was the, that was the American Red Cross. And, the um, Red Cross, that's right. Yeah. yeah, but for that too, I mean, a lot of it was like, a lot of centralization happens too. Um, I mean, because the Red Cross, their responsibilities are to build houses, right? It's more like Habitat for Humanity that uh, does that. So a lot of the, although some of the, funds were questionably used and there's a lot of ways um you know i don't think that they just you know came in and built three uh, four houses with 300 million dollars that would be just uh, too ridiculous <laughs> right 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 yeah all right let's see Clinton, did you say, was that an earthquake or bomb yeah that earthquake that was some so some some of that video was kind of hard to watch but just like um i mean it's the reality you yeah know i mean it's the reality you can't you can't talk about that without you know like giving the real story and you know people a, a lot of people hundreds of thousands of millions of people were affected and yeah uh, 300,000 uh, deaths uh, approximately and 1.5 million um internally displaced people uh and it was crazy to come to Haiti after this earthquake and see all the different um IDP camps and all these people living in the cities and just uh, incredible. Yeah, and I saw um, you had that interview with um, Kyle Pedre. Mm -hmm. and he was saying that you know the leadership was like non-existent, like in those in that first week, where they didn't even hear from the president of the country after this. Yeah, the first, the first interview that they did with him, he just said, "My palace collapsed." You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know like, so. it, like it, like it was only his house that collapsed. Right? Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's see. Uh, so sad birthday swag. Oh, your birthday is January 12th. All right, yeah, hey, hey, can I say something real quick? Yeah, what's up, swag? Oh, man, I just want to give you guys your flowers, man. I, that was so great. I just love it. This whole week being, I don't know, can I find a word to describe it? Dave, friends, oh my God, this was just amazing, man. I learned so, so, so much. Thank you so much, guys. Hey, I don't know if you can find a way maybe once a month to do this, even though if things get back to normal, because this is very educational and everything with that, right? Yeah, I was thinking of doing something to kind of like keep it going. I got, I reached out to a few friends um, that are, you know, historians and, you know, different things that they can share. You know, I'm very limited in my Haitian history, <laughs> you know what I mean, and, and different things that I can offer. So I always look for, which is one of the reasons why I got Dave here. You know, I don't want to come across as I'm the, like a, the only reference of Haitian history where, you know, I learn things every day. I've learned so much from Dave. I've learned a lot from Bayana Bello. I've learned a lot from, um, you know, a lot of different people. So um, I want to try to have some type of like community where we could kind of like go online, have these webinars and we can have, do these, um, share this type of information in this format a little bit more frequently. So definitely looking into that. Yeah, absolutely. I think so too. I and mean, then to see people on all age and mid thirties, you know, so young and so passionate about the Haitian history when we was older, it's like the older, older folks had to teach us some stuff, but now to see the younger generation just into it like that, it's just, I don't know, I can't well, find well, I appreciate you. Describe. I appreciate you putting me in the in the younger generation. So, <laughs> so, so that, that, that's, that's why that's why you my guys. Man. All right, let's see. Yeah, you got, uh, I remember crying in bed for three days straight. Yeah, the earthquake. Yeah, it was definitely 
uh, something major graphic. Let's see, we need you now. My dear guys, thank you, swag. Uh, in the pictures, the USA were helping the Haitians recover from the earthquake. But before that, the USA sent 240,000 troops to Haiti. Why were they helping them? Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't ever remember that many soldiers. I know um, 20,000 U.S. soldiers came in 1994 to restore Aristide power. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. And we, we had some U.S. soldiers here after the earthquake happened, but it definitely wasn't um, yeah, it was never that many troops that that went to Haiti. It was probably never more than about twenty thousand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the U.S. is always in Haiti's business. <laughs> you know, so uh, it's never it's never far fetched to find a, a few thousand Haitian uh, American soldiers in Haiti um, during events, different events. Uh, let's see, in return for the invasion, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, they were trying to kill Haitians. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, they've killed plenty of Haitians, the U.S. have in, his, in the history of Haiti. So uh, we went over a lot of that in the U.S. invasion of Haiti uh, yesterday. Um, you know, the way the Marines were treating the, the Haitians. To see lies, Clinton just lies. Clinton and his regime stole money and implemented nothing. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I think that there are some things that, that the thing about uh, I mean, that Clinton is so crazy, the whole Clinton relationship with Haiti. Like, I, I remember reading somewhere that he and Hillary, they had spent their honeymoon in Haiti. <laughs> they go to like, um, um, and Marcy saw too, and the, there's a um, funny historical coincidence with that is that they spent their honeymoon. I think this was in 1975 mm -hmm. at the Castro Leclerc um, Hotel, and Leclerc, of course, the name of the of Napoleon's brother-in-law who led the French. Um, Wait a minute. There's a hotel in Haiti called Leclerc. Well, actually, the hotel it's no longer existent. But the hotel was established in what used to be General Leclerc's estate. In oh, Marcy okay. And Marcy Sun is actually where I'm from. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, so centuries later, this property, uh, part of this property became the Habitation Leclerc uh, Hotel. So the whole block still bears Leclerc's name over 200 years later. That's where Hillary and Bill had their honeymoon. And, uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah. And the hotel was actually um, owned and managed by, um, what's her name again, um, the African-American, Catherine Dunham, an African-American anthropologist and dancer uh, from Chicago. Who actually oh, yeah. Was, yeah, 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 uh -huh. yeah. So she owned and operated this hotel. And at part of that estate, too, across the street from the hotel was the Mangonez residence. And um, Albert Mangonez was the architect who actually sculpted the uh, Negmawon or um, Unknown Maroon um, statue that uh, everyone knows. And that's also part of the uh, um, you know, center of the logo of my production company uh, that you guys have seen. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, Frank, if you could forward that slide for so that, a little bit so they could uh, see uh, what I'm referring to for folks who don't know the Unknown Maroon or Negmawon. Yeah, right there in the middle of it right there. Yeah, let me, let me blow it up real quick. Yeah. yeah. There's a, I, I read a funny story about um, the construction of this maroon, mm -hmm. oh, come on, of this uh, unknown, what am I doing? Oh, okay, this is what I read. Yeah, that way you can see the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, like this was constructed, the actual uh, unknown maroon statue was constructed during the, um, the Duvalier regime, I believe, right? Like in yeah, the, yeah, it was commissioned the, by, um, by the Duvalier regime and Albert Mangonez, um, is the one who, um, who did it. The sculptor, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it's funny the way uh, I read a story about um, that actually it was an opposition group, like a student group who um, called themselves like the new, the, the new Maroons to, mm -hmm. to fight against, you know, a new form of slavery. And the coincidence about that is um, the Duvalier regime you know, pretty much wiped them out, right? 
and uh, and took but took on that moniker of you know the maroons and then it was like kind of like based off of the group that opposed him that he crushed and took on and pretty much adopted their you know maroon uh, uh, moniker that they were using and constructed mm -hmm. that unknown maroon so uh, I thought that was an interesting story all right let's see um Haitians are five percent African ancestry they are not less than two percent I think there's a confusion there with what Bill Clinton was saying that um, Haitians are two percent of the African American population in the U.S. Like Haitian immigrants. In oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think that was a confusion. There. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. He was saying how uh, Haitians were two percent of the population, but eleven percent of that population yeah. were. Right. Like, uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, why is Clinton so bad? Clinton was just a face for democracy. Um, I mean, if we, we could talk about all politicians, man. Like, uh, I don't think there's any politician that's exempt from being opportunist um, to to poor countries, especially in the, especially you know at the, uh, you know, capitalizing on suffering. I can't say like a general all politicians, but I feel like a good majority of them are are uh, opportunist in that point. And if they see a way to make some money, then you know they're gonna do it. And it may not even start out that way, but it, it was funny in in the uh, when you in the part of the documentary with Ayestid, uh he starts out as the priest, right, and he gets like the popular vote. And he's quickly thrown out of his office. But when he's put back in, right, then there's all of these new rules that he has to go by that the United States placed on him. Yeah, right? no, yeah, that was part of the deal, you know. For that, that was part of the deal. But yeah. he chose to be part of it. He could have just been like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm yeah. not going to do that. I'm not going to sacrifice you know my beliefs. Those are different errors who came back, you know. Yeah, well, it's not even the same person. You know what I mean? So... So yeah, so it's that, you know, that staying in power and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, three years, because he was in exile in D.C., actually in Georgetown. A lot of D.C. folks in here, so they know how um, how opulent that neighborhood is. So, you know, three years there, <laughs> you come right. back. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I guess he developed better taste, right? Yeah. <laughs> he also <laughs> he left the and, uh, and got married, so, yeah. That's I'm right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, I was living his life, man. <laughs> Let's see, exploited. Clinton just exploited Haiti. Yeah, I'll give you bad stuff. You give me good stuff. All right, where's the questions? Questions. Why are non-Haitian people being presidents of Haiti? Non -Haitian I think they were referring to uh, Charlie to uh, Baker, uh, Charles Baker. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, the the white guy. Poor skin. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you. Were, I mean, is he? Was he white? Is he white? Like, I mean, oh, I mean, in the Haitian context, yeah, he's white, but I mean, almost Haitian, every quote, white person here in Haiti has some uh, black blood. Um, right. Them, right? Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah, you know, pretty fair skin, and uh, the fact that his name is Baker too. I think his ancestors came from England, um, but um, he is a Haitian citizen, born and um, raised here in Haiti. Yeah. Although he is, but, and um, yeah, his last name is Baker. Yeah, I mean, even my own grandfather, who's Haitian, I mean, he's a white man. Like, I think he was from, like, you know, great, like, in Portuguese or something like mm -hmm. that. But straight white. But he's Haitian. He was born and raised in Haiti. You know, his father was a merchant and mm -hmm. came to Haiti. He set up shop. The family was yeah. been there for, like, two generations. But he looks white, <laughs> you know, but speaks Creole and uh, French and all these different languages. So, yeah. yeah. Can you all right. Talk can you talk about the rumor of uh, Hillary Clinton's brother and uh, the, re the relationship with Haiti? Mining. Yeah, I mean, there, the thing about Haiti, when a lot of these things are happening, it's a lot of rumors and it's hard to find the facts, um, but there are rumors that, you know, um, that Hillary Clinton's brother got some mining contracts here in Haiti after the earthquake for mining of um, precious metals here. 
in the country. Um, but again, a lot of it, it's hard to find the exact information to be able to confirm if it's, um, if it's true, but behind a lot of rumors, there's some sort of elements of truth. So um, who knows? Yeah, where, where there's smoke, there's usually fire. You know what I mean? So it, it might not be one thing that we think, but it's probably something else. Mm -hmm. but, um, but the thing is, it's like the history would, it's hard to give these, like, these people the benefit of the doubt, right? Yeah. So it's like based off of like your actions in the past, then what's to make me believe that this, you're not going to do something like that? So uh, that's usually how it works. Let's see. Why are not? Okay, they're puppets for democracy, commonwealths. When, uh, can you see the chat board, um, yeah. Dave? Yeah. Okay, there's this one question that's in Creole, I think. Good. Um, let me see here. Uh, choo -choo 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 -choo. Um, my mem da bga me kone. Peace. I'm sorry, I have to. Hello. Like someone trying to say something. Someone... Hello. I'm sorry. I have to. <laughs> I have to leave like in the next fifteen minutes. Um, but I wanted to ask a question. Sure. Go ahead, ask a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I did, I, my phone was going in and out. <laughs> I'm sorry. So um, first, thank you for having this. I really appreciate it. Um, I am not of, of Haitian descent. However, I am Puerto Rican and Jamaican and uh, was an English high school teacher teaching in Southwest Florida. And very, um, and also consider myself to be a Pan-Africanist and love Haiti. And, um, you know, we always look to Haiti and Cuba when we talk about Pan-Africanism and revolution and what does that look like. Um, so thank you for having this. I really appreciate it. Um, I guess the question I have is, and I don't know if I missed the other, um, well, I did miss the other ones. I don't know if it was, if, if it was um, talked about in the other lives or the other um, workshops, but um, where does spirituality I guess ancient traditional spirituality in, in Haitian, I mean in Haiti, with Haitian voodoo or voodoo from um, benign, how does that play a role in like um, the sustainability or the people or even like moving forward and revolutionizing um, um, and, and getting back to, I guess, and getting Haiti where it needs to be or where they, they visualize and want to be as a, as a whole? All right. You want to go first, Dave, or you want me to go first? Um, well, I think, uh, um, you know, in terms of the spirituality, I'm not sure if um, you were here for um, the second session um, in particular, in which we're talking about the revolution and the role that um, mm -hmm. Voodoo played with Wakaima ceremony in 1791, and um, even before then with um, Makondal as well. Um, so definitely that element. You know, without Vodou, a lot of historians believe that the Haitian Revolution would have been possible. And, you know, what's been happening in Haiti and the years since, especially since 1860, when um, Haiti signed the Concordat with the Vatican, um, there's been an effort to eradicate Vodou in the country. And then the recent years, in particular, since the 1950s, you've had a lot of um, Christian missionaries, particularly. Uh, from the south uh, part of the U.S. traveling to, like, uh, you know, eradicate voodoo here in the country. Um, but in recent years, I feel like there's definitely been a, sort of like a, an awakening among Christians to, um, you know, to sort of like derail a lot of these movements and to uh, give value to, to voodoo, um, you know, given what it means to this country's history. Um, and there's actually a, a uh, American pastor uh, by the name of uh, um, Joel um, or Joel, mm -hmm. truly beloved here in Haiti. I mean, for about Austin. years, yeah, he's been doing a TV program here in Haiti to sort of like evangelize while also allowing Haitians to know uh, more about different um, cities and towns across the country. And he pretty much said that in all of Haiti's ills, such as uh, similar to what Pat Buchanan had said in 2010 after the earthquake happened, 
was because of uh, Kodu and the Haitians went after him. They're like, you know, we thought you were um, our friend and you loved us. You know, you need to get out of our country. We don't need you here. Right. So I think there's a, <laughs> a lot of uh, Which I, I mean, I'm, I'm a, being a practitioner of ATR, I'm not a voodoo practitioner, um, but I do practice two African traditional, uh, you know, spiritualities that are close, um, very similar to voodoo. Um, so definitely agree, um, you know, with that, which is why I posed the mm -hmm. question in, in, in the yeah. sense of, um, you know, how does that stand and how does that look like? And knowing the history yeah. that will do, the ceremony mm -hmm. did play a big role in mm -hmm. the revolutionary, knowing that, um, you know, even the, um, I can't remember his name right now, but he was from Jamaica and came there the as man. well, you know, mm -hmm. and knowing the relationship with that mm -hmm. uh, definitely think yeah. you know I'm, I'm not an, like you said I'm not an expert I'm not a I'm not here <laughs> you know I'm just a person an English teacher that reads and you know and and connected the spirit but definitely believing that that um and being and seeing it here in America like of African descent not necessarily of just Haitian descent, descent descendants but people who may be of Jamaican or whoever who may just be you know straight from the south are also coming into practice in Vodun and understanding that um Essentially, it is a spiritual warfare, you know what I mean? And um, having a foundation and those type of things um, trickle down into what we want to see manifest like on this realm, you know, as far as self-sustainability and, um, and being our own and, and owning our own and having our own. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I agree. Um, I believe that, but I think that the people of, of Haiti, uh, that there's this one one saying, right? That uh, Haitians are, what is it? Is it ninety percent Catholic, but one hundred percent voodoo? <laughs> I think Max Beauvoir says something like that. Yeah. Um, like even on the out, even when dealing with the missionaries, you know, I think the missionaries mm -hmm. come and, you know, they they have bread in one hand or something that the the population needs in one hand and the Bible in the other hand, and you know. They, they try to make you they take advantage of the people's poverty right. to you know, have them convert. And, exactly. You know, and, right. and I, I'm a Christian, but I've always been extremely, um, you know, against uh, these practices, especially to have people believe that they're poor because they don't, you know, practice right. a certain faith. And that's like, really? So they're going to uh, be better off economically once they become Christians, uh, which is right. nonsensical to me. And also, the other problem I have with it, I mean, sometimes you're from the U.S. to Haiti, and most of the people on the planes are missionaries, and these people, a lot of them are from the South, they're racist um, right. and biased against the Black people, and um, they're coming here to, you know, influence, um, you know, Haitians, and to have right. them believe that their traditional beliefs are, are, you know, are evil, and that they should convert to Christianity, right. and I think it's just uh, And it's and unfortunate there's an evangelical movement that's going on, not just in Haiti, but in on all the African con uh, countries as well, you know, um, I'll go, South America, yep. Right, all these, yeah, all these countries with indigenous traditions, you know, have been sustain sustainably and has been existing prior to Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's, um, it, like, I think it's important to, um, as I love this, as I, I'm so I'm so grateful once again that you had these 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 workshops and these lives and these these discussions. Um, it, you know, it's so important to see that as a whole, right? Like though it is, it, it, Haiti, um, it, it, uh, we look at Haiti to to see what does that look like. You know, the the effects of it, but it's it's wholly happening like to all African descendant indigenous countries. Um, with that, and I and like I said, I'm really, really interested in like the religion aspect of colonization and how does that play a role on you know on these other uh, powers that be, I guess so to speak. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank I you. Appreciate I appreciate it. Me. Yes. All right. Let's I see. Have um, a question. Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Lawanda. Um, my question is part of the video but also um based on some current information matter of fact as as er, last night even mm -hmm. cnn had um sean penn on to discuss um the um coronavirus and within his discussion about the coronavirus i guess his lead-in was about all of this stuff that he did with the united states military and haiti uh one of my questions that i posed that didn't get picked up 
was uh, when did he become the spokesperson <laughs> for Haiti and the things that went on, I guess, after the earthquake that happened. And so uh, I just wanted a little bit of back history on his involvement because I felt like it was just real concerning to me to hear him to keep speaking about Haiti the way it was without any representation from Haiti, without any uh, representation of a black person from the diaspora, from America, from somewhere to um, uphold, quote unquote, what himself and the United States military did to help Haiti after the earthquake and why that is important, I guess, on how they're handling the coronavirus response here. Yeah, yeah. So, and, uh, go ahead, Dave. You, you you probably know more about this than I do, but Sean Penn. Um, yeah, I think I don't know what his motives are. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I do remember, like all the he's always all over the place, especially in Haiti when disasters happen. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he's there um, all the time, like prior when there's not something happening where he's dragging his cameras to you know show him pulling I mean, people he, has, out of he has a good presence in haiti especially during the martelli government i mean he had a place here in haiti a house here and everything so um yeah. I think he was present. and he had his he had his ngo jphro um that he established after the earthquake to bring aid to haiti and this ngo was one of the largest ngos operating in haiti after the earthquake and it's actually one of the few ngos established um um, relief after the earthquake that's still present in Haiti uh, to this day, um, more than 10 years later. Actually, after the whole um, controversy surrounding the Clintons uh, during the 2016 um, U.S. presidential elections, um, the Clinton Foundation transferred all of their projects to Sean Penn at JPHRO and completely removed themselves from Haiti. So. Um, all of the projects mm -hmm. that are being managed by uh, Sean Penn's um, NGO, GPHRO, and Haiti right now. And there's also a lot of a strong relationship between Sean Penn and the Martelli government. And he was actually officially made a, um, a goodwill ambassador for Haiti by President Martelli, uh, Martelli um, administration. Um, although Sean Penn has sort of distanced himself from the uh, Martelli administration um, in the years since with all the scandals regarding corruption from that um, government, um, especially regarding the petro Bay funds that were provided by Venezuela. Yeah, wow, good, good. Good stuff, thanks Dave. Mm -hmm. And Dave, you know a lot, I got the right person with me to do this thing, man, that's for sure. All right, let's see, uh, agree to stop. Dave, you're a genius. Dave for president. Yes, indeed, Victoire, you're the best. Let's see, I'm glad that I signed up for the videos. I hate that I missed. Well, like I said, um, if you signed up, I don't know if um, I've been sending out links to uh, the YouTube page where I've been posting the videos. So hopefully you guys have been getting them. Uh, and I pretty much posting, I download all these videos and I post it to my uh, YouTube channel and that way you could get all the different links uh, in one place. So I posted the last three videos. Unfortunately, I didn't record part one with the Tainos. Um, so, you know, we'll see. I might try to do a quick version of it, go through the slideshow again and uh, upload that as well so I could have the whole complete um, week up there. Okay, I'd like to know what is your proposition? Do you have a utopia or do you know Long who really trying to help Haiti? And an ONG or organization? Uh, I'm not sure. I think that they were trying to write, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, all right. Uh, monthly would be great. Yeah, you could do something like this monthly. That's not too bad. You just have to figure out um, what to do. <laughs> Let's see, Bayina Bello made me know about this event. Okay, great. Yeah, Bayina Bello, she's one of my mentors. So for sure, I love Bayina Bello. And my, in fact, we might be doing something with Bayina Bello on the webinar very soon. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, what is your position on so many NGOs in Haiti? Well, Dave, you're in Haiti now. So is that, do the NGOs have 
um, like still a big presence like they used to in Haiti or is it dying down a little bit or is it ramping yeah, up? We had a lot of NGOs that came down immediately after the earthquake, so that was the peak. And within, uh, I would say within four or five years after uh, the earthquake, um, a lot of them, especially those who only um, established their presence after the earthquake, they left the country um, because the funding uh, dried up. So you definitely don't have uh, the same number of NGOs in Haiti right now that you had uh, 10 years ago, um, which, I mean, the issue with the NGOs is that a lot of them, they don't collaborate with the government and they just do um, their projects independently. And so when you're having all these NGOs with funding and they're just doing um, small scale projects and um, independently, then you really aren't able to maximize um, all of those resources to do large scale projects benefit the Haitian people. Um, right. you know, so that's the, that's the challenge um, with that. And, uh, you know, um, you also have issues with, with the governments too, that you've had a lot of corruption with, um, um, with different governments um, in the past too. So that's the other challenge that, um, that we have here in Haiti in terms of, um, you know, finding good leaders who have the country's uh, best interests um, at heart and um, take those interests into account when making decisions for the country. And to also not let, um, not let their uh, policies be influenced by uh, the international community to do what's best for the country without having fear of repercussions from, um, from the international community. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, it was, it was the corrupt government that gave rise to the NGO, <laughs> right? That pretty much birthed the NGO because these uh, international aid flooding in from countries um, to Haiti, and the government would pretty much, you know, be, you know, very corrupt and, you know, take a lot of it and put it in their personal accounts, or nobody knows what happens to the money because nothing is happening uh, in the country and the population. So the government is like, okay, well, you know, the international aid, like, okay, well, let's circumvent the government somehow, and, and then that they pretty much created this NGO. And a lot of people, the thing is, there are people that are doing some good things, but there are also people that are taking advantage of the situation. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, there you go. All right, good question, Chloe. All right. And actually, speaking of NGOs, uh, uh, yesterday, um, the government announced that we have our first two cases of coronavirus here in Haiti. <laughs> and um, oh, you know, yeah, there you go. See? Yeah, and it was two people from NGOs, uh, one from Belgium who, um, and I think the other one is French who brought the virus to the country. So uh, hopefully, um, you know, it doesn't spread like wildfire here in Haiti. Yeah, exactly, man. That's the last thing Haiti needs. Um, let's see, do you have other reference to propose other than Truyo, Bayo, CLO James, Blackburn? Can I ask another quick question? Uh, yeah, sure. Exactly. Okay. Um, my question is, are the... Um, are the, I guess, the Black Haitians that are participating in this corruption, are they being um, basically called out for what I would call, I guess, is that neocolonialism? Are they being called out for that? So that, like, how, how can that, that type of corruption be slowed so that the, everything can get on track without... Um, without totally alienating, alienating um, that the ha proper Haitian participation or outside participation for black people in the diaspora. Because I guess that was my main thing about Sean Penn. It was like, you don't have any pro proper black um, representation with you, along with you to kind of, you know, helping that guidance. And it's just kind of making it seem like, you know, where are we in helping our people, you know? How can we be a part of that? And so uh, my question is, it's like we got the, these bad people, I guess, that are doing the wrong thing with everything. How can we get more of those people that want to help um, involved yeah. in, in a part of that movement? Yeah, I think one of the bigger challenges uh, here in Haiti has been that, um, and this was addressed um, in the documentary, that um, historically the middle class has been quite passive. You know, they're um, satisfied with their jobs and um, their uh, lifestyles and they don't get too involved in politics. 
but at the same time too, when the situation of the masses um, is getting uh, worse and worse um, every year, it reaches a point where uh, the situation affects everyone and how uh, the country operates, uh, right? And what's been happening in recent years is that with the corruption at an all-time um, high, um, you know, with the funds that were given um, after the earthquake and also the Petro Caribe uh, deal that was done with Venezuela, to which Venezuela provided um, about $4 billion um, dollars to, um, to Haiti, right? That was uh, pretty much uh, wasted by, um, by successive government from 2006 to 15. Uh, people got fed up and you started having um, widespread protests being led by um, young professionals and university students, which you had never uh, really seen um, done to that scale in Haiti before. Um, so we definitely have a lot more engagement right now with the millennials and, um, you know, young professionals getting involved and organizing um, protests, peaceful protest movements to let the government know that um, this of corruption can't continue um, if we want to have a better Haiti for our children and our um, children's children. So um, th there's definitely been a lot of um, a lot done in terms of trying to get of bring the people who who stolen money um, over the past uh, decade or so of bring them to justice. So we really hope that um, that will move forward and that um, these cases will be brought to justice and these people will be dealt with and they'll. So as an example um, for uh, other people, other politicians who plan on doing things like that to know that if they do that, they'll, uh, they'll suffer the consequences. And I think that's how we get to uh, the change that we'd, like, we'd all like to see uh, Haiti. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. Uh, it kind of seems like people, you know, there's no consequences for their actions. You know, they people will continue to do that if they know that there will be no consequences, you know? <laughs> right, exactly. It's like a kid, right? They, they, they're just going to keep doing what they're doing until, you know, they're disciplined for it. And then that sets the example for future people who try to do the same thing. So, yeah. uh, all right. So, okay. Do you have, uh, was it, wasn't that a statue of, was that a statue of Toussaint or Dessalines? I think the one that was in the documentary was Dessalines on the horse, um, like towards the end. I think that's what that was talking about. I'm not sure. Uh, let's see, references. Uh, I like books. Um, I like uh, Laurent Dubois. Dubois got a couple of good books on Haitian history. Uh, you can look him up. Uh, let's see, do you know Cafe Fio Haiti on YouTube? They have good videos about Haiti and the struggles over the years. Um, yeah, Cafe Philo is a movement that's um, done here in Haiti, through which I think it's every Tuesday that they do it. Um, they have a, a group of um, young university students and young professionals who meet up and discuss various topics pertaining to, uh, to the country. Um, so it's been very popular here, and uh, some of them have been um, you know, televised and put on YouTube. So. Um, of course, they're in Haitian Creole um, mainly, with some in French too. Um, so, if you know people um, are able to speak those languages and understand those languages, they're great resources to be able to find out more about uh, what's going on in Haiti and uh, the people in Haiti's uh, perspectives. Awesome. Yeah, I gotta look that up. All right. Yeah, the Joel guy has always been a spy. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for this. I really enjoyed and appreciate it. You're welcome. How do we move beyond the narrative of Haitians being the victims and the white man being the bad guy? Uh, well, I mean, I've always had problems with that narrative. Uh, yeah, the yeah. white man has done a lot to us, but I always say that if we, as Haitians, we stand up and we have backbone, we won't allow them to do it. And I think historically, we saw the example of Antoine Fiume as opposed to Noah um, Alexi, right? With the looters affair, when Germany um, forced Haiti to um, you know, to pay money and to do all these things, you know, uh, 21 gun salute uh, to the German flag and all these things. And uh, the president at the time, Noah uh felt pressure to do it, whereas Antinor Fiume, you know, had a backbone and say, no, we, we won't take, um, you know, fall for this, right? I think we need more leaders like that in Haiti who, uh, again, take the countries or they're guided by the country's best interests and they won't uh, fall for the pressure of the international community. Absolutely, 100%. Absolutely, I agree with that. I don't have anything to add to that. 
All right, let's see. How do we move? Okay, you did that. Thank you, Franz, for your vision and leadership in this endeavor. Thank you, Dave, for contribution. We are grateful to have you in our community. No, thank you for granted. Looking forward to more webinars. And so thank you. Thank you, Victoire. I see. Thank you, Franz and Dave, for your time and information. Is, is there any regulations right now to foreign entries due to coronavirus? Uh, someone left the, here to go to Haiti. Um, she works at the, at the embassy, the U.S. Embassy in Haiti. And they said she had to go on a 14-day uh, self-quarantine. Um, uh, is, is that the case for everybody that comes into Haiti nowadays? So um, last week, the government had announced that um, no flights, um, only flights from the U.S. would be permitted and to Haiti, right? No flights from Europe or the DR. And I guess that's the American influence right there because it's, you know, this virus is uh, spreading in the U.S., so why? Right, the exactly. Yeah. I was thinking that. <laughs> but anyways, uh, but now with the detected cases um, that were uh, confirmed yesterday, I think they're stopping all flights and they're closing all ports here in Haiti. Um, both airports and um, maritime ports to not allow anyone to come into the country um, as we try to um, deal with this situation. Yeah, I think I think that's a good idea. All right, cool, man. I think that's it. So, hey, Dave, man, you're awesome. Thank you for stepping up and doing this with me this week, man. I really appreciate you. And um, um, you're doing a great job. So it's a uh, you know it's. I had to definitely um, step up and uh, contribute um, as much as I could, man. So, yeah, ab absolutely, absolutely. Thanks so much. So, of course, these webinars are sponsored, right? So, uh, Thoroughbred Books—that's me. I didn't, I didn't do a good job on these, um, on these slides today. But uh, yeah, Thoroughbred Books—that is me. Uh, you know, of course, I, a publisher wrote a couple of books, published a few books on Haitian history. So if you want to support, definitely hit my website, www.thoroughbredbooks.com. Get yourself the whole collection. And, um, you know, you can share the, these stories with your kids uh, or just for yourself. They're great as gifts as well. So definitely support that movement. And of course, Dave has his um, uh, initiatives as well. Yeah, again, um, we got basketball to uplift the youth here in Haiti, working with youth in Cité Soleil, Marchisan, uh, Marchisan being the neighborhood where I'm from, and these are the toughest neighborhoods here in Port-au-Prince, so a lot needs to be done with the youth in those neighborhoods. We're working with youth girls ages eight and up to um, use basketball as a way to educate them and to provide them with mentorship. Um, so again, anyone is interested could go on our website, um, HaitiBasketball.org, and then we have uh, my production company too. Valley Real Productions, which, which put together this documentary that you guys watched today. And, um, you know, we have a variety of different other projects that we do. Um, the latest project that we did was a, um, a video on a Kobe Bryant mural that we did here in Port-au-Prince. And I'm sharing the link here, the YouTube link, so you guys could learn about that and see some of the other work that we do. Um, yeah. Yeah, I saw that mural. That mural was really, was really good. That was, that was dope. Yeah, man, we're just trying to do different things to uplift and to, um, you know, positively influence and to, um, you know, bind up the, uh, the situation here in Haiti. So definitely got other projects that we'll be doing um, similar to that in terms of different murals to, um, to bring value to people who've contributed to, to this country and to uh, the diaspora in general. Absolutely. Well, keep it going, brother, man. Be watching. And uh, you're doing some great stuff down there. So anything I could do to support, you know, you know where to find me. <laughs> all right. So, okay, everybody, that's the end of this webinar. And that's the end of all of the sessions. The Haitian History 101 is now complete. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in uh, for this whole week. I'm going to download this video that we just did, uh, upload it, so that you guys could have the whole collection as well. And um, I want to thank my co-host, Dave for doing a great job helping me out with this. And, um, and I wanna thank everybody out there for logging on and you know, sharing uh, this with us, uh, especially in these times that we're going through where we all kind of like locked down at home. So uh, you know, hopefully you guys learned a little something new uh, about our beloved IET. So I think that's it for us. So I'm about to shut this down. 
And so everybody be safe out there. Uh, Dave, go ahead and say bye to everybody. <laughs> All right, everybody, uh, it was a pleasure joining you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, thanks again, Franz, for um, inviting me to, to join you. Yeah, absolutely, brother. So we'll be in touch. And everybody, stay safe out there. And of course, wash your hands. All right. So I'll talk to you later. Peace. All right.